now an esteemed computer scientist, Professor John Hopcroft, amongst us. John Hopcroft is an IBM professor of engineering in a, and applied mathematics in computer science at Cornell University. He received his PhD in 1964 in electrical engineering from Stanford. His research areas include theoretical computing, especially analysis of algorithms, automata theory, and trap algorithms. He was honored with Turing Award, the prestigious ACM Turing Award in 1986. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association for Advancement of Science, IEEE, and ACM. Without further ado, please pay full attention to what he's going to say because this is going to dictate the future of our field, which is computer science. So looking forward to an exciting talk from Professor John Hopcroft. Uh, welcome, John. Over to insightful Thank words from you. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and have this opportunity uh, to talk to you and, and give you my view of, of the future of, of computer science. To get the first slide, they'll, they'll, they'll get it in just a second. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, I'd like you to walk away with, one of the ideas, is that the world is changing, and particularly that computer science is changing in, in a fundamental way. And those of you who position yourself for the future are going to have a, a tremendous uh, career. So uh, this is sort of the first slide. It says, uh, the information age is revolutionizing uh, basically all aspects of our lives and those individuals and institutions and nations who position themselves for the future will have a, a, a great uh, time. And to make that point, I want to tell you a little bit about my career because I graduated from Stanford uh, in uh, 1964 in an electrical engineering department. There were no computer science departments. I was hired at Princeton in the electrical engineering department, but fortunate for me, the chair of the department understood that computing was going to be important and asked if I would teach a course in computer science. And I had to ask, well, what does one teach? Because there were no books, there were no courses. And he gave me four research papers and said, if you cover these, it'll probably be good. But what I didn't realize is that teaching that course made me one of the world's first computer scientists. And that gave me many opportunities. Uh, whenever our country was looking for a senior computer scientist, I was on the short list. And so kinds of advantages that I got, uh, one, one day I, I got a call from our White House telling me that our president uh, wanted to appoint me to the National Science Board which oversees science funding to U.S. universities. Now, imagine if I had been in high-energy particle physics. I would still be waiting today for the senior faculty ahead of me to retire before I would get that kind of an opportunity. But because there were no senior faculty ahead of me, I had a tremendous opportunity. And when I tell this story to, to students today, they say, well, you were fortunate because you started your career in 1964. But one of the points that I want to get across today is you are also fortunate because computer science is undergoing a fundamental change. And if you position yourself for the future, uh, you will have similar opportunities. So in the past 30 years, we were concerned with making computers useful. So we were interested in compilers, operating systems, and programming languages. Uh, and I don't want to say these things aren't important, but that's not where the exciting research is going to take place during your careers. Uh, in the future years, you're going to be tracking ideas in uh, enormous uh, amounts of data uh, and things that you're going to extract signals from noise. and. One of the most important things to realize is that the field is going to become much more application-oriented. 
Uh, when Yellick was, was talking this morning, she, she mentioned how every field of science was using computing. Uh, so in the past 30 years, we were making computers useful. In the next 30, we're going to look to see what the computers are, are being used for. And the drivers of this change are the merging of computing and communication, uh, the wealth of data that's available, uh, the networks of, of sensors and, and devices. And what we have to do is we have to develop a theory uh, to um, support the new things that you're going to be doing. And I, I've made a list of things here. And maybe I could ask if there is some way that the slides would be a put somewhere on a website so if anybody wanted to get them they, they could they they could get them uh, so I'm going to talk about one of these things up here you might wonder why do we need a theory of sparse vectors and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute but first let me give you an outline of, of the talk uh, first I'm going to give you a short view of the types of research that you will do in the next 30 years. And when I give this talk, I often talk about a science base. And people ask me, what do you mean by a science base? So then I'll give you an example of a couple science bases. Uh, one on large graphs and the other for high dimensional data. Uh, so a sparse vector. Uh, a sparse vector is maybe a vector which is 10,000 uh, coordinates all of which are zero except for three or four of them. And why am I interested in sparse vectors? Uh, the reason is, is I go to a large number of talks. And when I hear some idea which comes up in various different fields, then I know that that idea is important and I better understand it. And so I heard about sparse vectors in a number of talks. Uh, some of them had to do with tracking the flow of ideas in scientific literature. Others had to do with biological applications. Uh, others with signal processing. And the fact that sparse vectors came up in these different areas just clued me in that it was important. And let me just give you one application. I'm going to talk about bi a biological application. Uh, let's say you were trying to grow a, a new type of apple that maybe you wanted it to be brighter red or something like that. Then uh, what you would do uh, is you would have a, a matrix, and each row in this matrix corresponds to one apple tree in your orchard. And the columns correspond to positions on the genome for the apple. And what, what you want uh, is there's a, a short vector over here which is some observable property that you want to change, like how red the apple is. So for each tree, you would put record in that vector how, how red the apple was. Then uh, what you would like to do is you would like to solve for this unknown vector uh, that's, that's here. And those of you that are mathematically inclined, you're going to say, wait a minute. Uh, because there are many more columns than rows, there's a whole vector space of solutions. Which solution do you want? Well, it turns out that if you ask for a sparse solution, it's unique. And there are two reasons why it's unique. One of them is it has to do with evolution. Uh, since this vector is going to tell you the genes that produce that property that you're interested in, evolution is thrifty and it would evolve only one set of genes for this property. But there must also be a mathematical condition that the solution is going to be unique, and that's something that, that we should study. And when I get a little further into the talk, I will show you what that mathematical condition is that forces the solution to be unique. Okay, and down here at the bottom of the slide, uh, you're not going to get a, a completely sparse vector because of random noise and so forth. But you can see that in this particular case, it looks like there are three genes which produce a particular property that you're interested in. Okay. Uh, did I go too fast? No. Uh, 
one of the things that uh, you're going to be involved in is, is creating databases, uh, just thousands of different databases. And one of them is going to be, we're probably going to digitize medical records. So if I became ill when I was here in India, I would want a local doctor to be able to download my entire medical history so he could give me the best possible treatment. But I'm not sure that I want my insurance company to be able to look at my entire medical record because they don't need to know that. All they need to know is that they owe some doctor here a certain amount of money. And we would also like to let uh, uh, researchers have access to these data, uh, medical records to do statistical analysis. But we don't want to let them have any personal information. And so the question is, is how do you create a database like this uh, where the information is there, but people can only access it in certain ways and not get other information? And we're starting to develop uh, uh, technology to be able to do that. And one of the technologies is something called a zero-knowledge proof. And a zero-knowledge proof is a proof of a, that a statement is true without providing any other information. So in the case of medical records, all my insurance company needs to know is that they have to pay a doctor a certain amount of money. Uh, they don't need to know even who the patient was or what the medical treatment was, as long as they had a rigorous mathematical proof that they owed the, the money. Okay, so I'm to assume that you haven't seen a zero knowledge proof so I will uh, show, you, show you one and how it might work. I'm going to assume that you know how to play Sudoku. There is this nine by nine board and there's some numbers on it. And what you have to do is fill in each row, each column, and each three by three square with the numbers one through nine with having no duplicates. And what I wanna do is I want to prove to you that I know how to fill in this board without giving you any information whatsoever as to how to do it, okay? So the way I'm going to give you the proof is the following. I'm gonna take some little pieces of cardboard and I'm going to write the appropriate number on the pieces of cardboard and put them face down on the square that didn't have a number, okay? Uh, and now you wanna make sure that I put these that I actually have a, a correct solution. So you might say, show me the first row. I'm gonna pick up the pieces of cardboard from the first row and shuffle them and give them to you. And you can look and see that the numbers are the complement of the numbers in the first row. Then I'll put the pieces of cardboard back down and you can check another row or a column or a three by three square. Now, if I don't have a correct solution, pretty soon you're going to catch me because I'm going to give you a set of numbers which don't match what they should be, okay? Now, notice that you can't just check each row, each column, and each three by three square because what you don't know is that I put the pieces of cardboard back down in the same order they were when I picked them up. But if I don't have a solution, you know there's some probability that you'll catch me and if you ask enough questions, uh, you'll either catch me or you'll drive the probability to zero that I don't have a solution, okay? Now, you may say this is kind of a trivial problem and what you would like is you'd like to see a more complex proof. So, let, let me say I'm in the business of coloring graphs with three colors so that no two adjacent vertices are the same color, okay? And you happen to have a graph with uh, 10 million vertices in it and you would like to have such a coloring. But we have trouble doing business for the following reason. We don't trust one another. Uh, I don't wanna show you the coloring before you pay me because I'm afraid you may walk off and not pay me. And you don't wanna pay me until you're sure that I actually have a coloring of your graph. So the solution is, is I give you a zero knowledge proof that I have a coloring and then maybe we can do business. So the way here that I, I do the proof, whoops, is what I, for each vertex, I will create an envelope 
and I'll put in that envelope a piece of cardboard with the color for that vertex. And then I'll seal them up. And now what you're going to do is you're going to say, I want to check some edges and make sure that the vertex on either end of that edge are two different colors. So you pick an edge, and I give you the two envelopes. You open them, and you see that I got those two vertices correct. You do not have any information as to the coloring for the following reason. If I have a coloring, I could permute the colors to get those two vertices the, the colors they actually are. So I haven't given you any information. But you're going to want to check uh, more than just one edge. And if I let you check a second edge, then I've given you some information. And I don't want to do that. So what I do is I take all the envelopes and I burn them. Then I permute my coloring so I have a different coloring, but I just interchange red and blue, for example. It's the same coloring, just with the colors permuted. And I put the pieces of cardboard back in the envelope, seal them up, and you can ask another edge. And after you've asked a, a number of questions, uh, you'll be convinced that I have a, a coloring of the graph. Now, you might say, that's going to be a lot of envelopes, because remember, the graph had 10 million vertices. And you may ask a billion questions. Uh, does this make sense? Well, the way we're really going to do this is I'm not going to use uh, pieces of cardboard and envelopes. Uh, we're going to agree on an encryption scheme for encrypting the colors. And when you ask for the color of two edges, I will give you the keys to decode the color for those two edges. And so this is really just a transaction between our two computers. And uh, you can ask uh, maybe a million questions per second and uh, check and make sure that I have a color. Okay. Now, it turns out that these zero knowledge proofs and differential privacy and things like that that are being developed uh, come up in many, many applications, and I'll, I'll show you another one. Uh, let me take uh, just about cars and roads. Um, th it comes up, this, this issue of, of zero knowledge proofs is going to come up with almost everything you do. Uh, in the case of a car, uh, modern cars uh, record the GPS coordinates wherever you drive. And I discovered that I could go back in my car and see where I had been in the past year. Now, one of the things is, it turns out that quite frequently, uh, I drive from uh, Ithaca to Philadelphia, and I come down this yellow road, and I want to get on this interstate highway. And I come down this yellow road, and then down here, and at the bottom, down here, I, I get on the highway. But I noticed that, since I drive quite frequently, that many cars were turning off earlier. Uh, in fact, what they did is they turned off and went on this yellow road um, uh, oh this this is the red that's the way I normally drive, but I noticed that people were taking this other road and you might ask the question, why did my route guidance system not give me this other road? Well, they don't know the how, what the conditions of back roads are. And so they always keep me on main highways. Uh, but the local drivers take other roads. And in fact, what I then discovered is they found even another shortcut, uh, this, this little blue that comes down here and, and gets on much quicker. Now, uh, what you could do is uh, if every time I took my car in for service, they downloaded my GPS coordinates, and they did this for all drivers, they could figure out how local drivers found better ways, and they could put that into the route guidance system, uh, and there'd be some efficiency. Uh, one thing is, you might say, why do we want these minor improvements in efficiency? Uh, if this was a 1% improvement, you're talking about billions of dollars of gasoline that would be saved. So it, it's something to do. But I'm not sure I want these people to know who I am and where I drive. If they have my, the GPS coordinates, they can look to see where I park my car at night so they can figure out where I live and who I am. They can see where I go in the daytime so they know where I work. 
They can figure out where I shop. They can figure out all kinds of other things that I may not want to let them know. So this would be another case where we would like to let them download the coordinates, but give them no information as to who the driver is or where they, they live, where they work, and so on. And these are the kinds of, of systems that you're going to build. There are literally thousands of areas that we have to put these databases together. And that's one of the things that's going to be done in the next 30 years. So I'll talk about another item. Uh, in the past, sociologists could just study very small groups of people. But in the future, they're going to be able to study millions of people because of social networks and how they communicate and things of this type. Uh, one important question is, is uh, how, how do communities form? And how do they evolve? And if a community gets too big, does it bifurcate into two communities? Questions like this. So uh, here's the community. Uh, this blue community I've, I've labeled theoretical computer science. And I put myself in it. And I have quite a few communications with other theoretical computer scientists. But it turns out I have many other communications outside of the theoretical computer science because I'm in many other communities. And uh, we don't really yet have a good definition of a, of a community, but I want to talk a little bit about research in this area. So questions that you might want to look at is what types of communities are there? How do communities evolve over time? And are all social networks similar? People who write code today to find communities seem to think that all networks are the same, and if they find code that will find good communities in one network, it will work in every network. But that is an assumption there, a hidden assumption that all networks are the same. And I'll give you some evidence that, that they're not. Uh, one of the things we need to do, though, is we'd like to have a definition of what we mean when we say two graphs are similar. Uh, when I was a student, graphs had only 10 or 15 vertices, and you could draw them on a piece of paper. And two graphs were similar uh, if they were isomorphic. Uh, or you only had to change one or two edges to convert one graph to the other. But these two graphs, I would say, are similar. Uh, but you're going to have to change almost half the edges to convert one to the other. So the definition of similar is going to be quite different. And I don't have a good definition. That's a research problem today, is to come up with a definition. Uh, one of the things, uh, I would say these two graphs are also similar. It's just one of them is denser than the other. But from a structural point of view, they look similar. And I would say these two are similar. It's just one is smaller than the other. Um, and the reason I don't think size is important is if you look at the data from Facebook, where uh, each Facebook account is a vertex. And if someone sends a message from one account to another, there would be an edge. Well, the Facebook community is growing with time. And I don't think the structure of the network is changing. It's just getting bigger. So we have to have a definition of similar, which is fundamentally different than, than definitions we've used in the past. Uh, the two, these graphs that I showed you uh, happen to be a particular type of random graph, and that's why I, 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 I say they're similar. They're, they're all, all four graphs that I showed you there are simply random graphs. But let, let me give you some evidence that social networks are not similar. Uh, one of the things that we did is we selected eight data sets. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, journal articles in LiveJournal, Amazon, two Facebook networks, and three biological networks. And we selected community detection algorithms. And we applied each community detection algorithm to each of the networks and created a number of communities, uh, about 100 for each of these category of algorithm and network. And then what we did is we partitioned the data into two components. Uh, a training set of data, and a testing set. 
And uh, we created a list of features of, of the communities, and we trained a support vector machine to correctly identify the training data. Okay. Then we applied the support vector machine to the test data, and it pretty much got all the test data correct. And that's evidence that there must be some difference between these networks and between these uh, community finding algorithms that the support vector machine could learn to correctly uh, classify the, the test data. And so that sort of says for community finding algorithms, we're going to have to have algorithms which are particularly for a given type of, of network. Uh, let me talk about structure in a network. Um, suppose we were looking at research papers and we were using sort of a word vector model to uh, represent a paper. What we do is we take all the words in the paper and we sort them and we count how many occurrences of each word. And then we create a vector of 25,000 dimensions. Uh, that's the number of words in the English language. And we record how often each word occurred. And that's a very powerful model. Uh, and it, it's used extensively uh, today. Uh, it's used by search engines for uh, when they're dealing with web pages and, and things of that type. And, and by the way, I said there were 25,000 words. But when I asked Microsoft what dimension they use, they said it's more like 300,000. And I thought, 300,000 words in the English language? Uh, they count as a word, IBM or ACM. So uh, their notion of a word is, is a little different than, than the word in English. But suppose then I was to classify research papers. What I would probably get is a classification where some of them would be physics, some would be math, some would be chemistry, some would be biology. But there's other structure. This is sort of the dominant structure, and that's why it's what you're likely to get. But some of the papers may be survey papers, some expository papers, some research papers. And these will have slightly different vocabulary. Uh, and if the dominant structure didn't hide this structure, this is what you might get. Uh, another structure is someone, an English-speaking author is going to use a different vocabulary than uh, someone where English is their second language or uh, someone in some other uh, nationality. Now, this is also a structure. You ought to be able to pull out those papers which were written by someone where English was not their na native language. Uh, established authors probably have a different vocabulary than new authors. And so there's a number of levels of structure uh, in this, this network. And the question is, is how do you find these hidden levels of structure? Just to give you another example, if I asked you to cluster these letters, uh, probably what you would do is you would say, oh, that's easy. I'll put the A's together, the B's together, and the C's together. But unless you looked very closely, you would not notice that some of these letters are black and some of them are gray. And maybe you want to cluster them by color. Or if you look closer, that might notice it by type font. So there's lots of different structures, but usually there's a dominant structure which sort of hides these other structures. And the question is, how do you find these other structures? So let me talk about uh, discovering hidden structure in social networks. Uh, I'm going to create some synthetic data, and uh, this matrix is the adjacency matrix for a graph. The rows and columns uh, correspond to the vertices, and there'll be a zero. There'll be a zero. Is that me making that? Uh, there'll be a zero if there's no edge between two vertices, and there'll be a one if there is an edge. And so in this synthetic data, what I did is I made a no. 
Okay, so it was me. Uh, so I made a number of uh, tightly uh, tight communities. There's a number of edges within the community, but no edges between communities. Then what I did is I added some random noise, and then I permuted the rows and columns to get a graph like this one over here. And your job is given this graph to find the permutation of the rows and columns, which will produce the, the, the structure. Okay, uh, but what I could have done is I could have created my synthetic data, my, my communities there, randomly permute them, the rows and columns, and then put another set of communities on top, and then commute, permute and give you this graph, and now ask you to find the two structures. And what you would probably do is, you'd probably, today's clustering algorithms would find one of the structures because it's more dominant and kind of hides the other. So, am I underneath? Great, thank you. Uh, now we know it was doing it. Very, very good. Thanks. You, you would get an A in my class. So, I'm going to give you this graph. And I'm going to ask you to find the structure in it. And when I did it, very quickly a student came in and said, I found it. I deserve an A. Uh, he found three communities. They're fairly tightly, quite dense. There's no edges between them. But then a second student came in and said, I found it. And he found five communities. They're quite dense, and there's no edges between them. Which one? Do I give the A to? Well, it turns out both of these structures are in that graph. I just embedded the two of them together, and so maybe both of them should get an A. But this is the kind of structure that's in, in various networks, and, and we want to be able to pull out. OK, so those are the kinds of things that some to give you a sample of some of the things that you're going to do in the next 30 years. Uh, and it's going to be exciting. But it's going to require that we create a database to do these things. And people always ask me, what do you mean by a database? So I'm going to give you an example of a couple. Uh, one of them is large graphs. Uh, when I was a student, uh, graphs had only 10 or 15 vertices. Uh, you could draw them on a piece of paper. And if you removed an edge, or added an edge, you probably changed an important property of the graph. Uh, but the graphs you're going to deal with are going to be different. Uh, they're going to have uh, billions of vertices. And the exact edges that are present are not critical. If you randomly remove 10% of the edges, or you randomly add 10% more edges, it's, you're not going to change any fundamental property of the graph. And uh, if we're going to have a, a, a theory, uh, it must be that you've got to be able to prove some basic theorems. So there's, there's a good theory of graphs that was due to Erdős and Rainey. Uh, this was maybe 20 years ago, their model. Uh, what they did is if they want a graph with n vertices, they put the n vertices down. And then for every possible edge, they flipped a coin that would come down heads with probability p. If the coin came down heads, they put the edge in. If it came down tails, they left the edge out. Okay, And it turns out that uh, this theory of, of graphs is well developed. There's at least seven books on uh, erdős rényi graph theory. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, one of the things you can prove is that if you calculate the degree distribution, uh, it'll be binomial. And that means that uh, the degree of every vertex will be concentrated close uh, to its expected value. Okay. Now, this, this was uh, nice theorems. There's, there's lots of theorems in these books. But 
somebody, people started looking at real world graphs. This is a graph for United Airlines route map for the US. Uh, cities are vertices in the graph. And if there's a direct flight from city A to city B, then there's an edge connecting those two vertices. Okay. If you look at the degree distribution in this graph, it's anything but binomial. You'll notice that uh, Chicago and New York and Denver, San Francisco and Los Angeles are very high degree. And then there are a lot of uh, vertices which are very low degree. Uh, some, some cities only degree one or two. Uh, so we need a different model than the erdos rainy model. So uh, what people have done uh, is they've looked at a generative model for, for random graphs. They, they start with a small, num a small graph. And at every unit of time, they add a vertex. And then they add an edge connecting that vertex to some existing vertex. And the question is, is how do they pick the existing vertex that they're supposed to be connected to? Uh, one way is to pick a vertex uniformly at random. Uh, another is to pick a vertex with probability proportional to its degree. And this latter method is called preferential attachment. And if you use that, uh, then you will get a degree distribution, uh, which is a power law degree distribution. And it looks something like this. And uh, in theory, uh, this degree distribution goes down as 1 over n cubed. And if you look at real world graphs, many of them have degree distributions that go down as n, 1 over n to the 2.95 or something like that. So it's very close to, to what the theory suggests. Uh, an exercise that, uh, when I teach this material, uh, um, what am I doing now? So this has cost me two A's. You know, one of these days I'd like to teach. I'd like to teach a, a class where everybody got an A. Uh, maybe I can give out A's to questions afterwards. Um, one of the uh, homework problems that I assign is I say, go out on the web and find a database that you can electronically convert to a graph. Okay, so, so I went out and uh, I found an article in Science uh, on proteins, and there was some data associated with the article, um, and there were 2,730 proteins. So I said, oh, those are the vertices of my graph. And there were 3,602 interactions between proteins. And I said, oh, those are the edges in my graph. Okay. So then I took this graph and I found the connected components. And I counted the number of uh, connected components. So it turned out that there were 48 components, uh, just isolated proteins. Proteins didn't interact with any other protein. Uh, there were 179 pairs of proteins. These were just interacted with each other. But there were some triples of proteins and some sets of four. And in fact, all the way up, there was actually 16 proteins which interacted and formed a connected component. Okay. Now, when you do an experiment like this, you always ought to make sure that your computer program is correct. So what I did is I multiplied uh, the, the number of components of a given size times the size, and then added them up. And what I got is I only got 899 proteins. And where are the other 1,851 proteins? Well, I wrote the code pretty carefully, so I'm, I'm pretty sure it's right. So I thought maybe I ought to search a little further out. And as I searched a little further out, 
all of a sudden I found this giant component that had 1,851 uh, proteins in it. Now what you might do is you might say, wow, that was strange, but it's not. Because every student, and this is in a class with 150 students, every one of them found a database and every one of them had a giant component. And if it turns out, if essentially every uh, large graph that comes about from real world data has a giant component, then maybe we ought to understand why giant components are formed and why there are no intermediate size components. There are small components and there are one giant component, but there's nothing in between. And it turns out the mathematical theory explains that. And it's things like this that we need to sort of understand. I'm going to talk a little bit about science based for high dimensional space. Uh, because in the work that you do, you're going to be dealing with high dimensional data. I, I mentioned earlier the word vector model, and I said there were 25,000 words in the English language. And that actually Microsoft thinks there's 300,000, so their vectors are a little bit higher dimension than mine. But you're going to deal with high dimensional vectors. And it turns out that high dimensional space is fundamentally different than low space. And my intuition was formed in two and three dimensions. And when I started working in high dimensions, I realized, oh, I better understand high dimensions because it's fundamentally different. If I generate random points in two dimensions, and I calculate the distance between every pair of points. The maximum distance between a pair of points is going to be much larger than the minimum distance. Okay? But it turns out that's not true if you generate points in high dimension. Um, if you generate them in high dimension, uh, it'll turn out that the distance between all pairs of points will be essentially the same. And one of the reasons for that is something that's called the law of large numbers. And this, this is something that's absolutely critical to understand the law of large numbers. Uh, what it says is if you add up some uh, values of a random variable and take the average, it'll be very close to the expected value. Okay? Um, and so if I calculate the distance between random points x and y, what I'll do is I'll take the distance between the coordinate x sub i and the coordinate y sub i, I'll square it and add it up over all the dimensions. If x and y are random points, the coordinates are random, the difference of two random numbers is random, and the square of a random number is random. So I'm adding up d random numbers. And what I'm going to get, the answer I'm going to get, is whatever the expected value of that random variable is. And that's why the distance between all pairs of points will be essentially the same. Now that should trouble you a little bit because if you're going to have computer programs, let's say that cluster or do something like that, they're likely to be numerically unstable. So we better, better worry about this a little bit. Another difference is, suppose I take a unit cube, cube where each side is of length one. So in two dimensions, I have a square. Three dimensions, I have a cube. Four dimensions, something we call a hypercube. But the volume of that cube is always one. Uh, in two dimensions, it's one square unit. In three dimensions, it's one cubic unit, and so on. But what would happen if I took a unit radius sphere and asked, what is the volume as the dimension increases? Well, I thought, and I'm sure you would think, that in the limit as d goes to infinity, this is going to approach some nice number. Maybe we ought to figure out what that number is. And so I integrated the unit radius sphere in high dimensions. And guess what the answer is I got? It's zero. In high dimensions, a unit radius sphere has no volume. And it turns out high doesn't have to be very high. Uh, if you're in 20 dimensions and draw a unit radius sphere, it's not going to have much volume. 
Okay. Now, that may not bother you at first, but uh, let's see what some of the consequences are. Oops. Suppose I have a probability distribution. And I've shown here a probability distribution in one dimension. And my probability distributions are centered at the origin and have unit variance. And notice that the probability mass is maximum at the origin. And all of the probability mass is contained within three standard deviations of the, the origin. But what would happen if I had a Gaussian in high dimension? So it drops off in every dimension as a Gaussian. Well, uh, if I ask how much probability mass is there in a unit radius sphere, what you would do is you would integrate the probability mass over that sphere. But since the sphere has zero volume, you would find out there is no probability mass within that sphere. And in fact, there is no probability mass until you make that sphere of radius square root the dimension. Okay, so that says the points that you generate by a random Gaussian are all going to lie out in an annulus, which is distance square root d from the origin. So notice that even though the probability density is maximum at the origin, there's no probability mass near the origin. Okay. And you might ask, why is this an annulus? Uh, if I get far enough out that the sphere has volume, why don't I see a probability mass going way out? Uh, the reason you don't is the Gaussian is falling off exponentially fast. And the size of the, the rate at which the volume of the sphere is increasing is only polynomially fast. And that says that all of the points that you generate will lie in a narrow annulus. Well, it turns out that that's interesting for another reason. Suppose there was data coming from two Gaussian sources, which are separated by a little bit of distance. And when you get a piece of data, you would like to know which Gaussian generated that point. You ought to be able to tell because these two annuli overlap by just a very tiny, tiny amount. Um, ah, there. Uh, if a point is in here, you wouldn't know which Gaussian generated it. But if it's out here, you would know which Gaussian generated it, or here, you would know which one. Okay? So, so that's something that, 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 that you learn uh, from the fact that you understand that high dimensional space is, is different. Uh, what, what I, so one way to tell, uh, well, let, let me tell you an experiment. So what I did is I generated um, a thousand points from each of two Gaussians. And in, in one of the set of points, I, I colored them uh, uh, blue, and the other I colored red. But you'll notice that there's some red points way out here, and there's some blue points way out there. Now, I didn't give the students this particular picture. Uh, what I did is I colored all the points black. And I'll give you this data, and I'll ask you to color every point, either red or blue, and make sure you get them all correct. And it turns out there's a very easy way to do that. All you do is you calculate the distance uh, between points, each pair of points. And, and I'll show you that if they were generated by the same Gaussian, it'll have one value. If they were different Gaussians, it would be a bigger value. And that's what allows you to separate the two sets of points. Um, so if the points are generated by the same Gaussian, uh, I'm going to claim that the average distance is going to be the square root of 2d. Uh, the reason for that is uh, the points are going to be on a thin annulus of radius square root d. And I'm going to approximate that annulus by a sphere of radius square root d. And uh, if two points uh, 
you place two points on the sphere, two random points on the sphere, they will be distance square root 2 d apart. The reason I know that, there, there are a number of reasons, but one simple one is the following. Generate the first point. Once you've generated it, change your coordinate system to put that point at the North Pole. Then generate the second point. And the second point will be at the equator. Why will it be at the equator? Well, it turns out that in high dimensions, on the sphere, all of the surface area is at the equator. That's not true in three dimensions, because uh, if you go up to the Arctic, there's a lot of space up in the Arctic or in the Antarctic. But if you go up to 10 or 20 dimensional sphere, there is no surface area at the North Pole. Okay, so that, that's why I know this uh, point is going to be at the equator. And uh, these points, these two vectors that are there, are square root d distance going out to the, that sphere. And since they're essentially at a right angle to each other, the distance between them by the hypotenuse theorem is square root 2d. Now this, you might start getting bothered at this point. You can say, how could this possibly be? Uh, if I pick a random point on the sphere to be the North Pole, that defines an equator. But I can define all kinds of equators. And you're telling me no matter where I put the equator, all of the surface area is at the equator? That's what I'm telling you. Uh, you have to think about that for a little to figure out that it's true, but it's, it's an easy theorem to prove. Okay, and it's something important to know. Okay, so uh, if two points are generated by the same Gaussian, the square root two d distance apart, uh, if they're generated by different Gaussians, I think I have lost my. Oh, there it is. Uh, if they're different Gaussians then you generate a first point here, change your coordinate system to put it at the North Pole, generate your second point over here, and this second point isn't actually on the screen. Uh, although I couldn't draw it, I should have drawn it coming out perpendicular from the screen because I used one of my dimensions in picking the North Pole, and I've used another dimension for the distance between the two centers. And so when I pick this point, I need a third dimension coming out. But this is a right triangle. That says this distance is square root 2d. And then this is a right triangle. Oops. Ah. Uh, this is a right triangle. And so this distance is the square root of delta squared plus 2d. And as long as this distance is greater than this, plus another term here. Uh, this other term is there because I made some approximations. I approximated that annulus by a sphere, and I did. I said it was on the point was on the equator, where it was just almost on the equator. But uh, if you solve, as long as delta is greater than something which grows as the fourth root of the diameter of the dimension, uh, you can separate these points accurately. This is not the best way to separate these points. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a, another method in just a second. But if you're going to deal with high dimensional data, and in high dimensions, things are going to be numerically unstable, what you might think of doing is taking all of your data and projecting it down to some random lower dimensional subspace. And let's say you wanted to do clustering. If it turned out that the distance between every pair of points shrunk by the same constant amount, then you could do your clustering in a much lower dimension. Okay, so there's a theorem called the johnson lindenstrauss theorem uh, that says if you project uh, n points in d-dimensional space to a k-dimensional uh, subspace, all distances are reduced by approximately the same amount. And this allows one to cluster and solve other problems in a lower dimensional space. Okay, uh, so uh, 
what I could do is, if I'm, say, have K Gaussians, what I could do is I could put a plane through the center of those K Gaussians and project all the data down onto that plane. And I could do my clustering there. And in fact, that's what I, I would do in the case of the two Gaussians. So what I'll do is I'll draw this line through the centers of the two Gaussians, and I'll project all of the data onto that plane. Now notice that when I project this data onto the plane, what I'm really doing is throwing away Gaussian noise. Notice also that since the centers are already on the plane, they don't get any closer together. So what I've done is I've increased the signal to noise ratio, and that would make it easier to cluster. Uh, you might worry about this though. You might say, if you don't know where the centers of the Gaussians are, how did you draw that line? Or if there's more than two Gaussians, how did you draw a hyperplane through them? Well, it, it turns out Uh, well, it turns out that if you do something singular value decomposition of, of your data, it will tell you how many Gaussians generated the data, and it will also tell you the first k singular vectors will tell you, will span the space containing the centers. And so that's how you do that step. Um, and so this says that you could actually separate uh, that data uh, as long as they were separated by a, a constant, uh, simply by a constant. Uh, and if it's unit variant Gaussians, that constant is three. Um, so one of the things, by the way, I'm, I'm talking about some, some mathematics, which is important for the, going to be important for the next 30 years. And one of the things is if you go to my web page, uh, over on the left-hand side, about two, three inches down, It'll say book with Canon. And if you click on that, uh, you can download a PDF, which is a book which contains all of the mathematics that I'm talking about. And one of the things, uh, we're not going to publish this book. Uh, the reason being something uh, is sort of the economic model. Uh, if, if you download the PDF and you take it to your bookstore and ask them to print it for you and bind it, It'll, it'll probably cost you about $10. If we went and published it, the publisher would probably charge you $150. Okay, and it turns out the value to us is the more people that use the book, the more it's going to help our professional reputation. And it turns out that's far more valuable than any royalties we could get by publishing the book. So I think the model of publishing textbooks is going to change. Now, there, there is a slight difference. If, if you go to China, we did publish it in China because we struck a deal where they agreed to publish it for $6 a copy. And at $6 a copy, we thought that's equivalent to being free. If you actually wanted the Chinese version, it costs a little bit more because they had to pay the, the translator something to translate it. But uh, it's just understand the world is changing in many ways. And the ways people used to do things are not necessarily the right ways to do them in, in the current age. Okay. Um, an interesting exercise is how many orthogonal vectors can you generate in D dimensions? In two dimensions, you can just generate two. You pick the coordinate axis. Three dimensions, you get three. And it's quite clear that in D dimensions, you can only get D orthogonal vectors. You pick the, the coordinate axes, and that's the best you can do. But what if I didn't ask you to have exactly orthogonal? What if I said, I want a set of vectors where every pair of vectors is the angle is at least 85 degrees and no more than 95 degrees. So I want to get almost orthogonal. Could I squeeze a few more vectors in? And what I'm going to show you is how to squeeze 10,000 almost orthogonal vectors into a thousand dimensional space. So 10 times as many as there are orthogonal ones.
So I'm going to select uh, the basis vectors to get the orthogonal vectors. Uh, and I'm going to select 10,000 perpendicular vectors in 10,000 dimensions. And I'm going to project them down to 1,000 dimensions. And remember the Johnson Lindenstrass theorem says the distances are, are all going to shrink by essentially the same amount. If they shrunk by exactly the same amount, then they, the 10,000 vectors would remain orthogonal, but that, that couldn't happen. Uh, so this creates 10,000 almost perpendicular vectors in 1,000 dimensions. And this, this will just illustrate a little bit what I did. So I generated a random vector, and I used a Gaussian. So this vector, the length of it is square root of the dimension, which is 100. So each of these vectors is of length 100. When I project them down, uh, each of them will be of length essentially 31. And this distance here will shrunk by the same amount. So this will be almost orthogonal. And it turns out if you check the data, uh, it worked. A actually, to be honest, I only got 9,997. I had to throw away three vectors, which were just slightly out of that range of 85 to 95. OK, let, let me talk about uh, uh, learning theory. It, it turns out that there's been some major advances in learning theory. And today, we can understand what kinds of things that can be learned and what can't. And there's a notion called VC dimension, uh, which, which I'll talk about. Um, so, it turns out that there are a lot of databases that you might want to carry around on your iPhone. Uh, this one here is, let's say I take some census data, and what I have is for every person in the United States, I have their salary and their age. So a dot here, this is somebody age 31 who earns uh, $45,000, okay? Now, if you only wanted to carry this one database on your iPhone, you probably could do it. There's only 250 million people, and so it's not that much data. But this isn't the only database you're gonna to wanna to carry. You're gonna to wanna to carry a thousand such databases. So what you would like to do is say, could I squeeze, reduce the amount of data and still be able to answer questions? Well, the obvious thing that you might try is you might say, why don't I just sample this data? And how big a sample do I need so that I can answer questions that you might ask? Well, let's say the type of question you're going to ask is what I will call a rectangular question. You're going to ask, how many people are there in a certain salary range and a certain age range? So you want to know how many people are in a square, not a square, a rectangle. Okay. If, if I've sampled, uh, if, and if I've reduced the amount of data by a factor of 100, all I have to do is count the number of people in the rectangle and the reduced data set and multiply it by 100, and I'll get an answer which is very close to the answer that you want. Okay. But what if you ask, were allowed to ask an arbitrary question? So here's, here's the question that you ask. Uh, your intuition is going to tell you there's, there's no way I can sample, which will guarantee no matter what kind of a question you ask that you'll get the right answer. Because you could ask a question which uh, sort of uh, contain, contain a lot of points, uh, but in your sample is going to have very few. So um, what is the difference between this question and the rectangular question? And the answer is, for the rectangular question, it turns out there are only n to the fourth possible questions you could ask. So I've got data. I've got n points of data. And let me say two questions are equivalent if they have the same answer. Well, how many subsets of the data are there? 
If there's n data points, there's only two to the n subsets. Okay, but if I ask how many subsets are there that could lie in a rectangle, it turns out there's only n to the fourth. And the reason I know that is what I'm going to do, oh, one thing I better point out on, on this slide. Uh, for, uh, for one rectangle, so up here, u is the universe, that's my total set of data, and r is the rectangle, and if I intersect the universe, universe with my rectangle and get a number, uh, and I want to know what this, how big this number is, I can take my sample and intersect with the rectangle and multiply by the total amount of data divided by the sample. And what is the probability that these two numbers are going to differ by some number more than epsilon? And I'm going to claim it's going to be less than some number delta. And for one rectangle, by picking a sample which is large enough, I can make delta as small as e to the minus some constant times the sample size. Now, <clears throat> this says that for one question, if the probability you get the right answer is essentially guaranteed. Uh, but if you want to get the right answer for every possible question, you're going to take a union bound over all possible questions. Uh, if, if there had been an infinite number of rectangles, uh, then the union bound wouldn't work. However, there are only n to the fourth equivalence classes of rectangles, and so the union bound is going to give you something that grows as a polynomial in n times e to the minus a constant times the sample size, and by making the sample size something like four times log n, I can drive this, or five times log n, I can drive this down to uh, one over n. So I can make it, I can sort of guarantee you with high probability you'll get almost the correct answer for every question you can ask. And the reason it worked for rectangles is because instead of an exponential number of rectangles, there was only a polynomial number. Now, why did I know that there's only a polynomial number of, of equivalence classes of rectangles? So you draw a rectangle. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink your rectangle. I'm going to take this upper edge, and I'm going to lower it until it hits this vertex. Move this edge in, this edge in, and this edge in. and get this rectangle. And this rectangle, I can associate with each edge one vertex. Uh, so with every equivalence class of rectangles, uh, there's uh, a subset of four vertices. So they can both be n to the fourth equivalent classes of questions. Okay, and that's something that's called the, the VC dimension. And understanding the VC dimension of a question will tell you whether or not sampling is going to work. Uh, and the number of things that, of this type that, that, have, uh, that we've learned, which are it's important. But I'd, I'd like to talk about something called deep learning. Uh, uh, companies like Google and Microsoft have found 250 million photos on the web. And what they would like to do is they would like to be able to give you a photo in response to a query. So if you said, show me a photograph of a cat sitting on the beach watching the sunset, uh, they'd like to give you any photos which have that in it. Okay, now the way you would normally do things is you would hire some people to label a few thousand photographs. Uh, you would train maybe a support vector machine to recognize uh, these photographs, and then you would use that support vector machine to label all the remaining photographs. <clears throat> uh, the difficulty is, is how to label a photograph. Uh, you're going to have to maybe attach a thousand labels to each photograph because you don't know whether someone's going to ask about that beach or a tree or uh, sand or a dog or what, what not. Uh, so this is, doesn't sound like it's too practical a way. So what they would you'd like to do is change this supervised learning method to an unsupervised learning method. Uh, what you would like to do is find a way to train the support vector machine 
without giving it any data to train on. Okay, that's kind of an interesting idea. And I'll, I'll tell you how they've done it, and it, it actually works. Uh, but they did this at a, at a level that you probably can't do because they use 10,000 computers for two weeks. Uh, but uh, what they did is they discovered then, they looked to see what it had learned, and indeed one category appeared to be that of cats. So they were able to discover things that humans would point to and say that's a cat uh, without ever having show, told it what a cat was. Okay. So how do they do that? Well, they use something uh, called a threshold logic unit. Uh, a threshold logic unit has inputs, and let's think of the inputs as being zero or one. Don't have to be that, but think of it that way. And each input has a weight. Uh, you multiply the input times the weight and sum them up and compare it to a threshold. If it's greater than a threshold, you output a one. If it's less than a threshold, you output a zero. And what they did is they made uh, a network with maybe 10 hidden layers of gates. Now, uh, one of the things they didn't actually use pure threshold logic. Uh, they replaced the threshold by a continuous function because to train the network, they had to take the derivative of the error function with respect to the weights and then adjust the weights. And so they, they had to make the problem continuous. But what they did, uh, so, so this, this talks about this first difficulty. Uh, they dif to differentiate the error with respect to the weights, the error must be a differential function of the weights. But also, we must know, th know the error, otherwise you can take the derivative of it. Uh, but they want to do unsupervised learning, so they don't know what the output is going to be, so they don't know the error. How, how do they take the derivative of it? Uh, and turns out gradient descent is not going to converge in reasonable time if you have 10 levels. Because remember, each of these gates has maybe 10 million inputs. And at each level, there are 10,000 gates, and there are 10 levels. So you can calculate how many weights there are that they're trying to adjust. Um, so what they did instead is they converted this problem. They, they trained the levels one level at a time by the following method. They, they took their inputs, say there were 10 to the sixth, and then the first hidden layer, let's say, had 1,000 gates. What they did is they took the input and said, I'm going to train the output to be that input. So they converted the unsupervised learning problem to a supervised learning problem. And what they did is they got a more compressed representation of the data here. Um, and by doing this, they, they discovered that this was something that, that worked. Uh, I asked them, why does it work? And they said, we don't know. So this is a fundamental research problem, is exactly what is, what is going on here. But this is just an, another example of the kinds of research that you're going to do in the next 30 years. Uh, I'd like to mention... Um, uh, uh, I've showed you a science base for high dimensional data, uh, but what other areas do we need a science base for? Well, it, it turns out there are literally hundreds of areas that you're going to need a science base for. Uh, I just listed a few of them here. Uh, ranking. Uh, it turns out that, that ranking is, is a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, we, we all do it. Uh, faculty rank students. Students rank faculty. Uh, we both rank movies. We rank books. Uh, and uh, if you own a company, if someone did a search uh, on the web for something that your company sold, you would like your company to be the first uh, response of the, to the, from the search engine. And there are other companies that, for a small amount of money, will tell you how to develop your uh, web page to make it be the first that Google or, or uh, Microsoft returns. Now, of course, the search engines don't like that, and so they're spending a lot of money figuring out how to prevent you from doing it 
or detecting that you've done it and then undoing it. Okay, and it turns out that this itself is a multi-billion dollar industry now. Uh, so it would be interesting to come up with a method of ranking which you couldn't manipulate, or at least if somebody manipulated it, you could detect that it had been manipulated. Uh, uh, it, but it turns out there's an economist by the name of Arrow who said if you want your ranking to preserve certain axioms, you can't do it. Uh, but it's, it's an important area of, of research. Uh, collaborative filtering is if you buy an article, let's say something from Amazon, you purchase, make one purchase, uh, they will present you with an ad of something that you might like to buy. And usually it's something you'd be interested in. How did they figure out from one purchase what you might want? Uh, it turns out there's a mathematical theory that helps them do this, and developing this theory is important. Uh, dimension reduction I talked about, uh, extracting information from large data sources. There's just a, a list. There's, there's thousands of things that uh, we need a science space for. Um, oops. Uh, so what I'd like you to walk away with is that this is an exciting time for computer science. Those of you that are starting your career, you're starting it at the right time. And if you position yourself for the future, you'll, you'll have a great uh, lifetime. Uh, there's just a wealth of data in digital format uh, and networks to explore. Yeah, it's important to develop the science base to support these activities. And uh, those individuals, institutions, and nations who position themselves for the future will benefit immensely. Thank you. Someone would write or this one here too. <laughs> I think you made a very convincing case how the research in computer science is changing. My question relates to are we also entering the same phase in computer science as physics went through? In the sense that, you know, though quantum mechanics, you could still have to study classical mechanics. So it made physics harder. Do you think computer science is also getting going to be harder? Can we throw away the learning and the teaching that we do of the conventional things? Well, these problems require that we can throw away something and start somewhere else, or it will be that we need to first learn what we have been learning, and then we have to learn more before we can solve these problems. I, I, I think there actually is a, is a close analogy to what happened in physics around 1920, um, that the problems in physics became so large uh, that that they changed to statistical approaches. And I, I think that's one of the things that's happening in computer science. Um, so one thing that you, you ought to learn probability and statistics. That, that's uh, an important thing. Last 30 years, it was discrete math. but And it also turns out that much of the work that physicists did in the 1920s we're recreating today. Uh, for example, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I, I hadn't realized that that was a mathematical theorem. And it turns out that uh, it comes up in compressed sensing. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of the physics is, is very important. Yeah. Hello, sir. So, uh, what do you feel is the scope of low cost computing in terms of research? And this is this is with reference to Raspberry Pi and all the upcoming devices. Sir. So uh, Raspberry Pi is sure. I I Raspberry Pi and low cost computing devices. Oh, uh, yeah. All all of these things are are important. Uh, the, the fact that there are low-cost computing devices just opens up a whole range of problems that didn't, didn't exist before and, and how to deal with them. So uh, understanding these changes kind of will help you understand the, the theory that's going to be needed to, to understand how you could use them effectively. Yeah. 
Yes. This is an area, so, so the question is um, how important, I guess, is unsupervised learning? Um, I, I think it's a very important area. I don't think it's the it, that it's going to replace supervised learning. The, both of them will be important things. Uh, but it's an important research area because people don't understand how the unsupervised learning, why it works, and uh, fundamental questions there. Yeah. This is Pranath Deshpande, IPM Research. Um, so I think it was John uh, von Neumann who said that you never get, you never really understand anything, you just get used to it. So uh, that's something about intuition. Uh, so I was wondering about this higher dimensional space that you were talking about. So uh, is it a lot to do with developing an intuition for it? And is there, a, is it like, you know, you have to develop an intuition for each dimension? Or, or uh, I mean, uh, something that you develop for four dimensions is that valid for even higher dimensions and stuff like that? No, but it really has to do just with the fact that, that you're adding up a, a large number of random numbers. Uh, once the dimension gets above 10 or 20, thing, things don't change. I mean, so it's not like that dimension 10, dimension 100, dimension 1,000 are different theories. Uh, they're going to be the same. Uh, and it all really hinges on the law of large numbers. So that's something that you ought to understand. Um, and uh, very quickly, when you start working in high dimensions, very quickly, things which seem mysterious, maybe when I was talking, I said some things, you say, how could those possibly be true? Uh, all of a sudden, you'll understand it, and it all becomes obvious as to why these things are true. Con continuing analogy with physics, do you think uh, real analysis and functional analysis be relevant in computer science anymore? Uh, continuing the analogy with physics, do you think real analysis and functional analysis will be relevant to computer science after this? Is there a similarity between oh physics and computer science? Um, we're making use of a lot of things that physicists uh, developed uh, 80 years ago. But I'm not sure how much there is uh, a correlation. But I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story about quantum computing. Because I've asked some people who are working in quantum computing, who have sort of devoted their lives to understanding it. Uh, I asked the question, when are quantum computers going to be real? And they said, never. And I said, if it, they're never going to have quantum computing, how come you're studying quantum computing? And they said, because we think, coming from a computer science point of view, we're going to understand physics in a way the physicists don't. And maybe we can make a fundamental contribution to physics. Maybe. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not studying quantum computing, but uh, that's what people in the area say. So, when you were talking about uh, high dimension data, uh, distance measure you are uh, referring to Euclidean distance, right? The distance measure that you have shown was Euclidean distance. So, using Pythagoras theorem, you are saying root 2 of d, right? So, is it true in high dimension? Uh, it's kind of an echo up here. In that to Euclidean distance? Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, Euclidean. Is it true in the case of high, di high dimension data? Or uh, Euclidean distance is uh, or, uh, uh, two dimension? Or well, oh, I, I can't project things down to too low a dimension. Uh, the Johnson Lindenstrass theorem says log n. Um, after projecting to the dimension, uh, is the 
concept as Euclid in the is applicable for the higher dimension. Uh, it's the same concept of the Euclidean distance. Applicable for the higher dimension. Uh, you mean projecting higher dimensions down? Oh, oh, oh is, is Euclidean distance a, a way of measuring things in high dimension? Yeah, that's that's one of the normal ways of measuring, and yes, that's often what's used. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sir, I have a question uh, regarding your uh, the problems that you discuss about uh, sorry, uh, the scalability of uh, handling the large volume of information. How do you think the role of abstract interpretation as a technique? Uh, has the potential or I mean or formal analysis vis a vis model checking. I'm I'm talking about the importance of abstract interpretation versus model checking. How do you think abstract that's important? Abstract interpretation versus model yeah that's something introduced oh. by P. Carlson and uh okay, model. Is back. are you referring to model checking? No, I'm or talking about abstract interpretation, which is an alternate model checking for uh, it, 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 they defined it on a lattice, um, the two process of abstraction and concretization to move across the hierarchy of information, like the last example you were showing. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what an abstract representation is. Abstract interpretation. Interpretation. Abstract interpretation as an alternate to model checking or I mean, as a as a mechanism for analyzing those huge volume problems. So when you get up, so are are you asking a question about how you write a correct program, or how do you do the correct analysis? What's the what would be in your opinion the? Oh, role I mean that? That, that's that's a I mean it's it's a major area, and model checking has has been very effective. I, mean, I, I don't think people are going to ultimately prove programs correct with any reasonable significance. But they have uh, found ways of eliminating a large number of the uh, problems that arise. Uh, in fact, Microsoft had a lot of difficulty uh, because other vendors, the, the things that which were causing Microsoft trouble was errors in other vendors' code. And model check, they know uh, by model checking require that the vendors meet certain conditions. And this has eliminated many of the bugs that used to create problems. So it's a very important area of research. It's, it's not one that I'm very familiar with, though. Uh, by, by the way, one of the things I should say is I just picked a small piece of computer science. Uh, you, you could get similar talks in all kinds of aspects of computer science and uh, it's, it's a wide open field. Yeah. So, uh, uh, excuse me, sir. Do they need to learn probability and statistics? The foundational course, do you suggest that? A absolutely. Uh, uh, in, in the US, uh, almost every computer science department now has a requirement of probability and statistics. Uh, and something, if it hasn't happened in India yet, I would strongly encourage it. It's going to be important. That's for the curriculum committee in ACM to take up, Matai. Okay, we'll stop here and let's thank the speaker for uh, coming all the way and enlightening us. Thank you, sir. As a mark of respect and love, we would like to present a memento on behalf of the organizers. I request Dr. Srinivas to present the memento to show. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We will now have a tea break and we will assemble back at 4 o'clock for the next keynote session. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.